Hi, everybody. Welcome back to stage three. Some of you I might have seen earlier, but here I am again. Um, I'm here to uh, help you through our next talk on how to spark your journey into cybersecurity as a software engineer. We're excited to have you here. Okay. Why is it all echoey? All right, I'm going to try to make sure I'm not all echoey. Hopefully that takes care of that. There was a lot of I um, need to shut my door coming up. Did everybody hear that or was that just me? I'm here. I'm good. You're here and you're good. All right. I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> yeah, I thought I shut it. AC blew it open. No, no problems at all. All right, we fixed the sound problem and now we're really ready. So before we get started, I do want to, to, to tell people I will be monitoring the chat. I will be monitoring the stage chat, not the event chat. So if on the right hand side of your screen, you see the little chat screen, please make sure you're in the stage chat so that your comments come into us. That'll be important. Feel free to put in your comments. I'll make sure to monitor them and we'll get to them at the end. So up next, we have Madeline Torres and Aditi Chaudhry. Madeline and Aditi are security engineers at Two Sigma Investments, and we'll be talking about how to spark your journey into cybersecurity as a software engineer. Madeline and Aditi, you are up. Awesome. Thanks so much for that. So uh, as was said, my name is Madeline, and this is Aditi, and we're both security engineers at a data-driven hedge fund in New York called Two Sigma. So today we're gonna to be talking about how you as a software engineer can kind of transfer your skill set into security engineering or just security very broadly. So uh, before we begin, uh, we're gonna drop some links in the chat to a list of resources which we'll refer to over the course of the talk and that you all can refer to after the talk is over. In addition to that, we're also plugging our Twitter handles there in case you wanna follow us and ask us questions after the talk is over. So uh, I'm going to give a quick rundown of how we're going to be presenting the talk. Uh, Aditi and I are going to start off by introducing ourselves and talking about the kind of work that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. After that, we're going to talk about some of the challenges that we ran into in our specific circumstances in transferring from software engineering into security and some of the solutions that we found were helpful for us into getting there. Lastly, we're going to talk about the skills that we found as software engineers that were particularly helpful in our security careers, and then wrap up with some Q&A. So before we go into introductions, I just want to do a quick disclaimer uh, that we are not presenting any financial information or advice, and instead we're just kind of presenting our stories as is. So to start off, I am going to introduce myself. So as I said before, uh, my name is Madeline, or you can call me Maddie. And I'm a security engineer at Two Sigma, focusing on application security. So I'll start off by kind of giving a quick intro into how I got into security and computer science very broadly. Uh, that begins back in middle school when I was actually first very curious and kind of afraid of kind of how my computer's antivirus software worked. And through exploring that, I basically started learning how to program and just kind of kept security as somewhat of like a side interest for a while up until like undergrad when I actually majored in computer science. My first professional forays in computer science were in software engineering, which is where basically most of my internships were in undergrad. And it wasn't really until my like senior year of undergrad that I first started taking security classes. And then I had interned at Two Sigma on the security engineering team. I then converted full-time, I'm still there as a security engineer, as we just said before, and the rest is history. Uh, just a quick fun fact about me before I pass it off to Aditi. I have two cats you can see on the right, Alphonse on the bottom, I'm on the top. They are lovely, though they chew on more than they should, and, but that's just life of cats, so. I'm not gonna pass it over to Aditi. Thanks, Maddie. Hi, everyone. My name's Aditi. I'm a cloud security engineer at Two Sigma and a little bit about my journey into security. So I started coding when I was in high school. It was actually mandatory for us to take an introduction to computer science class in ninth grade. So that was my first exposure to tech and coding, really. Um, and I actually really liked it. I didn't think I was going to, but I did. I thought it was really fun, you know, to be able to tell my computer what to do and like it actually did it. 
that was really, really great feedback loop for me, being able to see my work pay off pretty instantaneously. And so I took a couple of other computer science classes throughout, uh, throughout high school and decided that when I went to college, I wanted to major in computer science or computer engineering. So I went to the University of Virginia, actually double majored in computer engineering and computer science and um, did a bunch of you know internships, all were in software engineering, but always was really curious about security just overall. And when I graduated um, from undergrad, I was working at a big financial company in the Northern Virginia area. And I was in this program, it was like a college hire rotational program where I, for the first year, I was gonna be in one role and then I was required to rotate to a new role. And so my first year I was a software engineer working on a customer facing application. And at that point I realized I didn't really wanna do full stack development for the rest of my career. I wanted to try something else. Like I really wanted to try security. And I was able to, uh, through a story I'll tell a little bit later, uh, actually do my second rotation in application security. So that was my first real like professional experience uh, working in security. I was doing pen test penetration testing for about a year. Then I did a couple of other projects as a security engineer before I switched to cloud security. And um, when I joined Two Sigma in 2019, I was also doing cloud security. And kind of throughout this whole thing, I decided I wanted to know more about the fundamentals of cybersecurity that I felt were kind of missing from my undergrad education. So I decided to do my master's at the University of Maryland in cybersecurity, and I graduated with that degree last year. So it was pretty exciting. And a fun fact about me, I'm actually learning how to play golf right now. So it's pretty fun. And, you know, moving on, I think a lot of times when I tell people that, like, you know, I'm a cybersecurity engineer, I work in security, I do cloud security, the question always comes up, like, what does that actually mean? Like, what do I do on a day-to-day -day basis? So to answer that, um, you know, cloud computing comes with a lot of benefits that developers want to take advantage of. For instance, you know, it's easier, faster, it's easier and faster to develop applications in the cloud and deploy them. And sometimes it's also cheaper, depending on who you talk to. But, you know, it's a great environment, I personally believe, for development. Um, I absolutely love developing in the cloud. And it's just, it's a it's fun, it's exciting, it's new, you know? But then the problem becomes, okay, so if all these businesses are moving their applications and their data into the cloud, how are they actually being secured? So that's where I come in, slash my team. Um, we write products and tools and work with other teams to make sure that what developers at Two Sigma are doing and the applications they're deploying and the infrastructure that they're deploying, that that's all secure. And there's two ways that I do this. The first is I, actually write code, I will build products and tools with my team or with other teams in collaboration to help secure our cloud environments. And the second way I do this is I actually will partner with these development teams and work with them um, when they're beginning a new product or a new feature or something and make sure that you know we're thinking about security in their design and their code and their infrastructure from the start so that we can avoid any you know crazy unexpected things later on, we want to catch it all from the beginning. And um, so, you know, to dive into a little bit more of an example, one of the tools that I work on mainly is this, it's a cl automated uh, cloud governance system. We call it Peregrine, which is a type of Falcon. But essentially what this does is there, it consists of multiple scanners and a scanner will have rules and a rule essentially just checks the service um, in the cloud. So, you know, if it's an AWS, it might be checking an S3 bucket. If we're in Google Cloud, it might be checking an, uh, like an infrastructure, a compute instance. And, you know, what we're checking is to make sure that these resources that are in the cloud are configured to meet our security standards. And so every hour, our system will run these scanners and these rules against all of our cloud accounts. And if it finds a misconfiguration or a violation, it'll actually automate, I mean, it'll, sorry, it will notify the account owner that like, hey, we found this thing, here's how to fix it, let us know if you need help. So it's like a really cool way to take something that would require a lot, a lot of hours manually, automate it, and just, you know, try to bring more security to our cloud environment. So like, how do I actually do this? I use Python mainly to do uh, all my application coding. 
I also use Terraform, which is an infrastructure as code language. And the two technology, I mean, sorry, the two cloud platforms that I mainly use are Amazon Web Services and Google Cloud Platform. Great. So now I'll talk a bit about what I do. So application security at Two Sigma is definitely uh, a little broad as, you know, even outside of Two Sigma, it's even broader than that. But I'll talk a bit about a slice of what I do and I do today work. So to, before I can kind of dive into like the kind of tooling that I mostly work on developing, I'll first present a class of kind of attacks known as supply chain attacks. And so I feel like that's pretty pivotal to understanding like what exactly the tool that I work on does. So just as kind of like a brief example of what a supply chain attack is, so I think that's probably the best way to explain it. Say that you're a, as an example, say you're a developer working uh, on the network of whatever company you're at and you have a need for some package that's hosted externally. Now, what you're gonna do is you're gonna eventually download that package from that external source and use it on your local machine. Now, a malicious party can basically kind of take advantage of this in a few ways. One way is they could be explicitly malicious and if they find a way to kind of take over whatever external repository is holding this code, they can put malicious code so that way when you download it and bring it internally, what will basically happen is they can find a way to gain access to the inside of the network which you're on by exploiting something inside that package that you downloaded. Now, uh, another uh, possibility here is you can download a completely legitimate package that just happens to have a vulnerability that either is known about or is not known about and an attacker on the outside can still take advantage of that. And so in general, that explains what a supply chain attack is. Basically, you leverage some kind of vulnerability from something upstream that can propagate then downstream. And what my exact job is, is kind of addressing this by building tooling that can A, make sure that whatever we bring on domain is legitimate and trusted. And even more than that, just making sure that whatever packages we do have are being used are up to date and have as minimal vulnerabilities as possible. So much of my engineering work is working on creating this tool that can kind of cross-reference like known vulnerabilities with the dependencies that a lot of the code inside our firm uses. So what, what technologies are used to do that? And like, how does that general workflow go? So in general, uh, at least in my experience, the, the workflows that I have are very similar to basically most other software engineers at Two Sigma, except it's just being applied to a security specific problem. So a majority of the code that I write is in Python and because of the nature of the Tori Oregon, uh, most code that I look at outside of Python is Java related. And peripherally, we're also kind of adopting and looking at Golang code. So that's, that's an extra bit of flavor there. And the workflows that I work on a day-to-day -day basis are pretty standard for software engineering where it's, I write code, I write tests, I push it to some external code reviewing tool, it gets reviewed and once it's approved, that's pushed and I repeat it over and over again. Uh, in terms of like, say some technologies that I work on, uh, I definitely use Flask to kind of deploy some of the services that I have. Um, we use continuous integration using Jenkins to have like, some testing as well as some uh, integration with other products that we have at Two Sigma. And overall, it just tends to be kind of in line with, again, other software engineers at the firm. So now that we have an idea of what a DT and I kind of do, uh, how did we get here? How did we go from our software engineering backgrounds to security? So to start off, let's first discuss some of the challenges that we ran into in our specific circumstances. And to begin with that, uh, I'm first going to talk about kind of our academic backgrounds and basically the issue of there not being that many classes at universities. So to kind of recall what I said before, I went to MIT and there weren't that many undergraduate classes that touched upon security topics. In fact, my first exposure to security in an academic context was in a single unit in my one, in an upperclassman systems engineering class. And outside of that, the only other security classes that there were were a few of them that were graduate classes. So that was already one initial like barrier. Basically, it was difficult to kind of run into security kind of like in the wild, so to speak. And basically, if I wanted to look into security as someone who already had an interest in it, I had to kind of go out of my way to look for it and try to take graduate classes that would where I would actually learn some of that information. And it's definitely a common experience that I've heard from, from friends at other universities as well. 
yeah, me being one of them. Uh, so like Maddie said, I only had one security class um, in my undergrad curriculum. It was also an elective, which was only accessible when you're an upperclassman. So I think I took it my junior year of college and it was called Defense Against the Dark Art. So it was definitely like really fun. It was an intro level security class. I learned a lot and that's what kind of started, like kickstarted my interest in security. But it was a little unfortunate that, you know, I take this class, it was really great. It was only a semester though. I didn't know what to do after that. And like Maddie said also, you know, a lot of my other classes, uh, we might have talked about security. Like my database class, maybe we talked about like SQL injection, how to avoid that. That was really it. There was nothing really, you know, like, you know, you take this class and this class, like a 101, a 102, 103 type of uh, like ladder that just didn't exist. And I don't even know about grad classes. I don't even remember like thinking about like, oh, as an undergrad, can I take a grad class? That never even crossed my mind. So, you know, that was slightly unfortunate. And kind of with that, you know, since I, we don't have classes to learn, I feel like, you know, the next step when people want to learn about something is like meet people in the field and like talk to them about what they do. But we both also found that there were minimal networking opportunities with security professionals available to us. I remember when I was an undergrad that every career fair or like company event, a lot of software engineers would be present, um, like product managers, project managers, executive level people even, you know, uh, alumni who went to the school and who are working there and came back and want to share their experience. And while that was all great, you know, and I learned a lot about what software engineering and industry would look like, I never met a security person at any of those events. And when I asked people from the companies, like, can you connect me with someone in security? They almost never knew someone in security. So that was also definitely really challenging, just like as a student trying to find someone to talk to really, and, you know, just pick their brain about what, what do you do? And I think the first time I was able to talk to people in security was actually after I graduated and was working full time. Yeah, I kind of echo what Aditi said. I, I feel like I can break down kind of like the issues I had with like trying to meet security people as an undergrad in like three different areas. The first area being like kind of academics. So I know we talked about like undergraduate classes kind of not really being super prevalent for security. And I feel like the kind of like corollary to that is it, I wouldn't really run into like any faculty or professors who we're doing any kind of security related research. And I feel like that already is just kind of like a big like miss essentially, since I know like at least in other classes I had, the professors would talk about their work like a decent bit. And if I'm not getting the security exposure there, that, that was already like strike one. The second thing that was pretty difficult was in any kind of like career event that I attended in undergrad. So like whether that be career fairs or external talks that were just hosted like, in the area, it was like not very often the case that the individuals who came from different companies were talking about security topics. In fact, I think like almost never basically was that the case. Like whenever I'd ask the software engineer, like, oh, like what do you work on as so-and-so companies? Like, oh, I, I do full stack development, or like, oh, I work in the front end, or like, oh, I work in this back end team, or I do data stuff. And I like at least like in my own experience, I I never met someone like at a career event that did security unless it was like a security specific event. Um, then the third area, which was kind of like a, like kind of like the like last kind of uh, loss there, was in a professional environment. In all of my software engineering internships, I never worked like on a security team until I was at Two Sigma. And prior to that, whenever I asked people on my team, like, "Oh, I'm interested in security. Like, do you know anyone I can talk to, or do you know anything about the security team at the company?" They'd be like, "Oh, no, sorry, I don't really know anything about it, or I don't know anyone there." And the best that they could kind of relay was just like general like misconceptions. And at that point, it was just a little like difficult to figure out like, oh, okay, well, how how can I get the information about like how this company does security? So aside from that, uh, the other thing that like at least uh, I ran into, I know that some other people have ran into, is just like where do you start with like educational resources? So if you can't really rely on like uh, academics too consistently or just like casual run-ins to people, um, how how do you do that? So there are, I mean, there are definitely like a ton of security resources out there. Like we've definitely comp like compiled like a list and there are a ton of other lists out there that 
people could look into. But I know that for me personally, uh, it was difficult to figure out like where exactly to start and like where to get like that initial set of information. So I think like, uh, like for me, like if I did find like a lot of those big lists, it would get like a little overwhelming. And so it'd just be kind of like lists to that or like links without any context. And like, it, it wouldn't be super clear, like if it was geared towards beginners or intermediate people and that that was already kind of like a later stage problem the, fir the first stage is like figuring out like where to look for the these security resources to begin with and that in, in and of itself is definitely a challenge depending on like if you know like where to look and like like if you do know like where to look like how to kind of parse that information yeah for me i think the biggest thing was even if i had a list of links i didn't know if it was like safe to click on I think I was like actually legitimately scared to Google some of the things I was curious about or like with visit some of the websites because you know there's like things that are sometimes said like oh if you like Google like how to hack a website or like something like that you'll like Google's gonna flag your name and you're like getting trouble and I was just like I just want to do good in school and graduate you know so I don't want to like get in trouble by Googling something even though like I am curious about it I just don't want to get in trouble and same thing with clicking on links like I don't want to click on something that looks really sketch and somehow possibly infect my computer so for me it was also just like you know what's reliable and like what's a trustworthy place to start learning um even if I like once I had those resources and just again to echo what Maddie said we did actually compile a bunch a, li a whole list of resources with commentary uh to kind of get around this challenge and you'll you can find them um, on our GitHub at the tiny URL that's posted uh, in the comment section. So yeah, definitely please, if you if any of this resonated with you, definitely go check it out. We spent time trying to compile this to help everyone not go through the same thing. Um, and then finally, I think the last challenge, the biggest one really was just like this intimidating image of security. For me, it was always like, you know, if you're gonna be in security, you're supposed to be a hacker. You're supposed to be like a very good hacker um kind of only the best can be in this field really and the other thing for me is like i i like talking to people and i like working with people so the image of a person sitting behind their computer in a dark room in a black hoodie that was really scary that was one of those things where i was like do i really want to do this for my career um like it seems high stress from what movies show you um it seems kind of lonely also and just like you know getting over that fear which i don't even know if i can say it was a fear it was just like stereotypes that i couldn't dispel because i didn't know anything really and hadn't met anyone yet but just like you know that was one of the big things for me you know will i actually fit and belong there yeah from my from my own experience and you can just especially talking to friends when I tell them like, oh, I'm interested in security or like, oh, like now, like, oh yeah, I work in security. It's just this idea that there's this like insurmountable learning curve that you need to have overcome in order to even consider a career in security. I think like whenever I ask people like, oh, like why not security? Or like, why not look into this? Like, I know that your interests would overlap with it. It's always like, oh, well, I haven't been like hacking for like 10, 20 years or something like since I was like a small child. So it's just not even like reasonable to like look into it. When I mean, that's just absolutely not the case. Um, I, I think that that image in and of itself is probably at least like the most like, I think brought up barrier whenever I talk about security with uh, any of like my friends or coworkers who aren't in security. And it's, it's actually kind of funny because then when you start introducing them like slowly to security things or like i i dragged a non-security person to a ctf once and they're like oh wow i really enjoy this and like they're able to do stuff like initially and it's like well yeah it's not like this like majorly arcane thing like if you're a software engineer you already have like a decent bit of knowledge about how computers work so that's enough of like a bit of like a base to kind of start building any kind of security knowledge off of so now that we have gone and talked about a lot of the challenges we ran into, it would be remiss to not give like some of our, our solutions to it. So to start off, uh, one of like, the best things is to reach out to security professionals. Now, it might not be super transparent in terms of like how you can like run into them or like whether or not these people do exist, 
But I mean, the, the answer is like, there, there are security faculty at like most universities. When you do work at a place, like they almost certainly have a security team. And it's just a matter of kind of like trying to find a way to reach out to these people. And more often than not, they're, they're willing to talk about their experiences. They're, they're more than happy to talk about what they do from, my, from like people I've spoken to. And I think that's like probably like a very like, I don't know, very quick ticket to get someone's individual story, like what resources worked for them when they got into security. And then more than anything, just someone to reach out to if any questions do pop up. To give a quick anecdote, I in one of my previous uh, internships, I was doing like data specific stuff. I, I was fortunate enough to finally have like a mentor who actually knew someone on the security team. And I went over and I was freaked out and I'm like, oh gosh, I don't know what to expect. But it was just like a similar room of just people like sitting at desks, like they were, they were having fun, having a good time talking and they were like, very happy and willing to share like all of their, what they were working on. And we're like, oh yeah, definitely. Like, you know, if you ever come back, like reach out to us again, maybe you can like work on something. And it's like the, the fact that they were like, so friendly up front was like a, a huge relief and B kind of like revealing to me that, well, at the end of the day, like the, these people are here also just like doing security stuff, doing computer stuff. And it's not like this like wild thing off to the side that you need to like have like these insane credentials to work on. Um, yeah. Yeah, 100% totally echoing that. I feel like for me, the biggest thing, honestly, like, so the story of how I got into application security, I was at a company event and I was telling my friend who was in the same program as me, but um, like the year above me. So he'd already gone through this. I was like, you know, I really want to do security for my rotation. I just don't know how, I don't know anyone. You know, we keep meeting all these people from all the other like software engineering towers, but I haven't met anyone from security yet. And he tells me, he's like, hang on, let me go get my friend. So he gets his friend who um, was in security. She actually was in the same program, rotated to the security team and connected. And he connected us and she was like, okay, let me go get my manager. So from me just telling my friend, this is what I wanted, like vocalizing that, I was able to meet uh, this other person in security, her manager, from her manager, he introduced me to other managers in security, so I could see, you know, what teams, um, like what the teams were, what work they were doing, what I would be interested in working in, since I hadn't really done anything in security yet. And that was just like super helpful. And I feel like, you know, sometimes it is scary to like reach out to people who you don't know, but I genuinely believe that like, you know, a lot of people are very nice and they do want to help. You just need to like take that first baby step and kind of vocalize what you want and um, just put it out there. And I think, you know, then the domino effect happens and you get what you want, which is great. Uh, the second thing that we both found to be very helpful is self-learning. So, you know, I think everyone says, uh, you know, you don't stop learning after you graduate school. Learning is like a whole, it's like a lifelong thing. I think that's completely true. Security is always changing because tech's always changing. And, you know, when you're trying to meet people in security and like talk to them about what they're doing, I think it re it's really helpful when you have some background knowledge of like what's going on in the industry, you know, what, what just happened, what was like the latest breach or attack, or like what new research just got published, or like what conference just happened? Like who was the keynote and like what what was like did you enjoy that keynote? Um just you know continuously learning about things that are happening in security or even the fundamentals of security, they definitely take you a really long way. And I would encourage everyone to not never like stop learning because honestly that's the only way you'll grow. And I think that's really important in security. Yeah, and I know for for me personally, the manner in which you approach self-learning is I think like a big step to it too. Because when you do get access to all these like security resources and like actually see what's out there, um, it can be pretty overwhelming because I, I know it was for me with those overwhelming to like figure out like where to start just because I, I mean, I didn't know anything. And there are so many different subfields in security to just start exploring. So I feel like the kind of like first like tip if you're kind of prone to this like overwhelming information problem is to probably just try to find like, I mean, look at all the areas, see what's out there and just try to like see something which you find particularly interesting and then probably like deep dive into that rather than try to like learn everything at once. Unless that works for you, like that's also fine. 
Um, but like, for example, like, I don't know, say you're like a really mathy person and like really interested in data science, like, I don't know, maybe take a look in cryptography or say you're like really like embedded engineering stuff and you did that before, then you might be interested in like looking at lower level security or like reverse engineering, I think it's closer to like that kind of stack. So I, I think that that's probably like a good like first place to start is just find an area which you feel like you're either either as close to something you know or just something that interests you enough that can keep you going. And then I feel like you can like slowly branch out from there. Um, another thing which I feel like also kind of helped me is if you're fortunate enough to like find yourself in an environment at some point where you can find other like-minded security folks, I feel like that's like a very like great space to just like also self-learn. Because I mean, one step to it is like, you can learn from other people around you. So like, for example, like one of the first CTS I did, I did with like a group of people and you can learn from the people around you. But at the same time, I feel like just like contextually, like being in that environment where everyone is hacking away at something, I, I felt like more inclined and more focused and just like looking up security things or working on that. And I mean, you know, for example, being, being at this conference is like a great step and great environment to do that in. And there are definitely enough environments out there that you know either other people can recommend or we can recommend that you can continue to put yourself in that I think like makes that self-learning process just like that much easier. The other thing which I think is generally pretty helpful, especially if you're from a software engineering background, is to just program. And I feel that can vary in involvement from something as little as like just keeping like secure principles and like defaults kind of like in mind when you're programming something like whatever you're working on to explicitly doing and pursuing like a personal project or work related or school project that is centered around some secure topic. Um, I know that one common and like very like smiles upon thing and kind of like the like engineering community is contributing to open source projects. And unfortunately, like there are a billion open source security tools and uh, programs out there that would be more than happy to have like contributions. And I feel like that's like not only a great way to learn about like that specific tool and like the topics it's kind of talking about, but also to just kind of like get involved with other people in the community and just kind of like, start building like that extra bit of knowledge in a security specific context. Yeah, 100%. And if you don't feel like, you know, you're ready at this point to be contributing to an open source project, maybe try introducing security concepts into like a personal project that you're doing or a project at school or even a project at work like one of the things that i did that i thought was really cool when i was a software engineer um the customer facing website that i was working on actually dealt with uh well obviously customer information since it's customer facing and you know there were security requirements that this information had to be dealt with like you can't have credit card numbers showing up in your log files and so like as a software engineer, it was really cool for me to be like, okay, I have this set of like security requirements. How am I going to implement them in my code to make sure that like our product is actually not going to cause an audit failure or something like that for the company? Because that would be really, really bad. And so just like, you know, starting to think about like if I'm working on the software engineering thing, let's say it's like a website, you know, what security things can I introduce into there? And from there, you know, I think there's a bunch of different avenues you could go down you could th think about like authentication or authorization database security um how to deal with data just from like a regulatory perspective your options are like definitely um there's a bunch of them so it's just a really great other way to have hands-on experience um and be able to show something to like future employers or anyone that you want to work with you know just be like hey i did this cool thing check it out it's on my github I think that becomes like really powerful and a really good icebreaker too. So we've kind of talked about our whole journey. And I think the biggest thing that we want to also just share with everyone is, you know, what did we learn through this, uh, through our whole going from like baby coders to software engineers to security engineers. And for me, it was definitely like one thing that I always thought was that I would need a whole different skill set when I went to security, that like all the things I did as a software engineer weren't going to transfer over and I'd kind of have to start like at square one. And that was so not true. You know, I think that what I should have realized, which I hope this talk will help everyone else realize is that I had 80% of the skills, you know, you have a lot of skills as a software engineer 
that are directly transferable to security. There's just a little bit and that's where the self-learning comes from. So just to go into a little more detail of what those skills actually are or what I think were the most useful skills I learned as a software engineer that were applicable in security. Um, so the first one was paying attention to detail. You know, when you're doing code things, you get your requirements, you need to make sure your implementation matches up to what the requirements said. The same thing is so true in security. You need to like make sure that, you know, when you're coding, you're not going to introduce a vulnerability. Uh, you know, the thing that you check, did you check all the ports in your network? Did you make sure nothing was left open? Paying attention to those small details definitely can make a difference. And it just makes you like a cleaner security professional because people know that you're not uh, like messy or I don't want to say like lazy, right? But you know, you you care, you're like paying attention. And you are trying your hardest to make sure that things are secure. So the second one is curiosity. When I was a software engineer, people told me to ask questions all the time. And I did because that's how I learned. But, you know, I think the other thing in security is that you definitely need to ask questions because, you know, and when you're when you're a SWE, it's like, okay, ask questions, understand the code base and contribute to it. When you're in security, it's ask questions and find the weak points of that product or that code or that like architecture diagram. So one example here was actually with Maddie a couple weeks ago, we were working on something and she asked me a question about why something was set up the way it was. And I was like, I'm not actually sure why. Like I've been looking at this code, so I've been familiar with that code base for almost a year and it's relatively new to Maddie. And you know, that question launched a whole discussion of why this thing was the way it was. We realized something wasn't as secure as we thought it was for kind of, a, you know, a couple months. And that led us to secure it. So asking questions is so important. And nothing is ever a dumb question. Because the discussion that comes from it, you'll learn something. And that's the most important thing. The third skill is teamwork. So, you know, I think the typical like sweet agile team it's like you know people are working together to accomplish a goal that could be launching a product into production it could be like you know developing a new feature and kind of talking about that stereotypical image of being in security being by yourself that's so not true security people also work on a team like you need to be able to communicate and collaborate with other people regardless of where you are and you know if something happens the ability to be able to work with other people and explain to them like this is what happened this is the impact of it this is how i think i should fix it that goes a really really long way so you know it's the same skill set whether you're a SWE or a security professional you're just applying it to a different problem and that's also very true for the last skill that i want to mention here which is debugging and you know i think as Software developers, we have a love-hate relationship with using the debugger in an IDE because no one likes bugs in their code. And sometimes it's easier just to print everything out and figure out what's broken that way. But the skill of being able to step through a problem bit by bit and figure out what's wrong and figure out like why, why it's wrong. You know, it's not enough just to identify it, what happened, but it's also like why did this happen and how to avoid it in the future. I think that is a very, very important skill in security as well. You know, if there's an incident, you wanna be able to go through the timeline of events and see what happened and, you know, figure out why it happened and make sure it doesn't happen again. And so, you know, I think obviously there's a lot of other skills that you develop as a software engineer and a lot of other skills that are applicable in security, but these are just the ones I wanted to highlight. Great. So now I'm going to go over just some examples, scenarios, very non-exhaustive uh, subset of cases where we're just want to try to kind of highlight, like, if it's not obvious, like how your software engineering skills could translate into security contexts. So as kind of like a quick like predecessor to that, I want to highlight just like a few terms that I'm going to use to kind of just help with use the examples. Uh, one thing for those unfamiliar is the idea of a red team. So to be very reductive and simplified of it, um, we're just gonna like red teams are basically kind of like the idea of uh, individuals whose responsibility is from like the attacking perspective. And their role is to essentially 
look at some kind of product or attack surface and try to find vulnerabilities that can be exploited in them. And the flip side to that are people on the blue team, which you can view as kind of loosely as a defense. And their role is to basically kind of protect these surfaces and try to patch any vulnerabilities and prevent them uh, from being exploited. So uh, now we can go into the examples and to kind of like encapsulate all of these as a broad, uh, under a broad like kind of observation is that it's very often the case that you can directly translate your software engineering skills and abilities and just apply it to a security specific problem. So uh, one example is kind of maybe with the idea of, let's say you're a full stack uh, engineer. So basically you're the individual who's going to be creating, say, like a website, both the front end and the back end. And who better to understand that system than the individual who created it, right? So in kind of engineering this kind of product, you have the knowledge of where the weak points are, like what kind of like maybe the more uh, suspicious bits are. And that can give you a good perspective if you're taking the red team approach on for similar applications like where you might want to look to find vulnerabilities. And conversely, from kind of like the blue team angle, like where in other applications you want to look for these issues that you maybe encountered in your previous career and try to make sure that those same issues aren't present. Now, the other example is kind of like the direct translation example. And I feel we can kind of bring almost like a, a very loose example of, from work, actually. And this is basically uh, in reference to kind of a new product that we're developing uh, in security engineering. And we needed a front end developer to develop the UI for the security product. And we just looked out for just other non-affiliated security front end engineers in the firm and got someone to help develop this. And I feel like that's just like a great example of like, well, that's a front end example. There are definitely a ton of other examples where you need people who are very specifically like knowledgeable in different engineering areas to help create security products and just for their security like projects in general. So the other thing is kind of in reference to the idea of documentation. Documentation kind of like debugging, I feel like is kind of like that like love hate relationship uh, that developers have, but it's so crucial and essential to engineering any product, both from the angle of trying to just explain how a product works and getting uh, feedback from other engineers on how it should be developed and how it should be improved to the angle of just teaching other engineers how something works. That way, if they're working on it for the first time, they can get kind of like kickstarted. And that applies to security products when we're engineering them as well. So I can speak for both me and DT, like whenever we create any kind of security product that we've been working on, we've needed to document it and kind of present it that way. The other angle is again, kind of looking at it from like the, the red team perspective and say you're like working on something and trying to find like vulnerabilities in an application and you find something that's half the battle. The other half is making sure that you can communicate that effectively enough and kind of explain like what the vulnerability is, like what's its risk, like how can you exploit it and essentially give enough information so that it can be fixed. Because in reality, like, finding vulnerability is like one step. The next step is making sure that it's, it's actually fixed, right? And having good communication and documenting abilities is the like key component to actually getting that across. The kind of like last uh, example that we want to bring up is like product design and development. So as an engineer, it's definitely pretty common that you're going to be creating designing something either on a small scale or basically having input on designing a product like from the ground up. And those like kind of like design and product foresight abilities are also like very essential in a security context. Definitely very clear, like if you're creating a security product where it's just essentially engineering in a security context, how those design skills can transfer. But just in general, it helps to have like a great understanding of how products are developed, how things are engineered, because at the end of the day, uh, one thing that you can look at, especially like in the realm of security engineering, is that security is this kind of thread that can go through all these products. And in order to kind of make sure that, well, if you're looking at it from a kind of like this like blue team angle, that they're secure, you need to understand how they work and you kind of need to understand this end to end process to not only make sure that like you can identify like how you can make something more secure, but also that it can be communicated in a way that can fit with different teams' timelines and making sure that it can actually like 
be considered in the development process. So now I'm gonna kind of bring it back to Aditi to wrap things up. Thanks, Maddie. And thanks everyone for joining us today for our presentation. We really hope that, you know, if any of this resonated with you, that you found you found this useful. Uh, just to end things, we kind of want to have a couple of call to action items. So the three things that Maddie and I both found useful in getting into security, we encourage you guys to kind of follow a similar suit. Uh, so the first one is to connect and engage with five people uh, this weekend at the conference. I pick five because it's like a lucky number for me. But you know, the good thing is Maddie and I can be two of those five. And you know, I think conferences are a great way to meet people and network. And there's even a networking portion of the Diana Initiative. So it makes your life a little bit easier. Uh, the second one is to check out the CTFs that are happening uh, for hands-on experience. Like Maddie said, and I also agree, they're super fun. They're a really great way to just, you know, learn new things in a gamified environment, which, you know, who doesn't like? And the last one um, for continuous learning, subscribe to a newsletter or a blog post or a podcast even uh, just to make sure that, you know, you're on top of all the security things that you want to know. And with that, we'll take questions now. Um, but uh, really quick while we do questions, um, we are hiring. So if there are going to be links in the chat for that and I don't know what's wrong with my deck but we are hiring. So if you are looking for uh, a job, definitely uh, check us out. We both love our experiences here and happy to take questions now. Awesome. Ladies, that was truly inspiring. Thank you so much for sharing. You really made my heart kind of pitter pat when you talked about lifelong learning in particular. That's, that's a hot spot for me. And I love to hear folks coming in and saying like, look, you, you have to keep learning because security is ever changing and you have to keep learning or you fall behind super quick. We do have some interesting questions. One of them coming in asks, what did you find harder to find a cybersecurity job or a developer job? Because they're about to graduate from college in a few weeks and are kind of in between both of them, applying to both of them, but are just kind of interested in the prospects. Yeah, um, I can go first really quick. So definitely check out our career links. Um, quick plug, I feel like recruiting will be very happy with us for saying that. Uh, but honestly, so I think when I was graduating college, it was easier for me to find a software engineering job um, than a security job. But I also wasn't looking for security jobs. So that was kind of on me. But when I was finding my current job at Two Sigma, uh, it was much easier to find a security job. I like set some filters on LinkedIn to say like what I was interested in. And then I was getting a lot of uh, like recruiters messaging me about roles that I was more interested in from like a security perspective than a software engineering perspective. But I would also say apply to both because it doesn't hurt to keep all your options open. Yeah, I kind of echo that. Like, uh, I can speak more from like the, I guess, like intern new grad experience. But I know that like when looking for internships and also like new grad opportunities, um, there weren't, I didn't see as many like security engineering jobs in particular. Um, I didn't look like too closely into like kind of like the incident response or like analyst kind of roles, but I do know that those are also pretty present. Um, uh, another thing to keep in mind though, with kind of like the like development versus like security kind of like if you're open to, for both of those at the same time, is that uh, you're not necessarily, I guess, like limited to one if you start off in, in the other. So like, I, I guess in like, uh, like our particular phase, like we definitely know people who joined as software engineers and then like within a year just switch teams to security. So I, I think that's like another thing to keep in mind, uh, it definitely varies between companies, but um, I, I think also like an extension to like what Aditi said, like I, I've seen like a billion opportunities uh, for security, like once you're already like past like the new grad stage, so. Definitely think like just keep an eye out for both and just know that like it's not like set in stone, whichever one like you can land. That's awesome. I have a I have a personal question because I think it, it runs the same challenge as the um isolated hacker in the hoodie. But both of you mentioned CTFs being super helpful and one of the things that I've found is that either people don't know what CTFs are or believe that they have to um 
be already experts to even participate in the CTF. So what kind of, if you can think back, at, how did you get involved in a CTF? Like what got you to your first CTF and kind of how do we get more people to recognize the value of those? So for me personally, um, my company, the first one I joined out of undergrad, they were doing a company wide, they call it a hackathon. And I think calling it a hackathon instead of a CTF helped because software engineers were very familiar with hackathons. And I think that change of word uh, kind of made it more approachable. But yeah, this company wide, we all sat in a bunch of like huge conference rooms with pizza and we're hacking away. And it was really fun. Um, and it was like a really cool way to like learn more about security with my friends at the company. Um, it was, you know, during work day. So who doesn't love just eating pizza and like hanging out? Uh, but no, I think it's a really good question. I think there were a couple of talks today, actually, of um, like, you know, if it's your first CTF, what to do. So hopefully people were able to check that out. But I think Maddie has a link that she added to the resources on how to find CTFs. Right, Maddie? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's right. Yeah, there, there are a few places that you can look at that just like kind of update a ton of CTFs that are going on. Um, awesome. Yeah, there's also a question in the chat about how do you break into the field if your work experience is completely unrelated? Yeah, I think that was one of the hardest things for me too. Like how do I convince someone in security to like, I guess, take the chance on me as a software engineer? And I think it's a couple of things we talked about, you know, networking and making that connection. So that person will take that chance on you, like they feel good about it, you know, but also, you know, kind of what Maddie was talking about doing the hands on experience stuff, uh, contributing to open source projects, putting things up on GitHub, that all that counts, like just because it's not a job, that doesn't mean you don't have experience. Um, if you can show what essentially I would say is like a portfolio of security work that you've done, um, like I, a lot of people will take that as experience, 100%. Yeah, I, I feel like at least like from my, my own personal experience, just like talking to other people, I feel like just having that initial interest in security is already just kind of like, probably like the biggest boon to get you started off. Because well, I mean, that, that definitely leads into like the curiosity of like exploring all these resources and trying to build that security knowledge. But at least like oh like at least like a lot of the other security people I've met are pretty enthusiastic to like talk about security and like other people who are into it as well. So that that's just kind of the first thing. And that leads into kind of like the like for me, I had just basically just kind of asked about it. Like I was like, oh, okay, like can I join a security specific team? And I did that enough times that eventually it ended up working. So I, I know that that was beneficial. Uh for people who I know that um didn't like have like that exact same route uh there's also the route of just like kind of like a dt said just kind of like taking those extra opportunities to learn or like contribute to the projects or even like uh, i mean kind of mention this also like the resources bit but like studying for certifications i know is like a common thing that people do who like if they have like no background in security it's just kind of like kind of like a good way to not only learn stuff from like a theoretical kind of standpoint and like flash a bit hands-on but also just have like a legitimate like cert certificate at the end that can be like, oh, okay, like I do know some things in like a certified manner. Good. Um, there's a question in the chat. What if previously in the software field, but you took a long break and your coding skills are stale? Um, I don't mind doing a little coding, but I don't want to be a developer. Yeah, I feel that on a very personal <laughs> level. That was that was very much me. Um, when I was doing penetration testing, my coding skills just like went like that. Um, I would say if you if you know what part of security you're interested in and it's not coding heavy, then I think just like brushing up on the basics, like you know maybe Python scripts or something, um, that would be a that would be okay. Uh, I think you know. In security, at least, coding is a tool to get things done. It's not like the main thing that you necessarily need, depending on the role. Um, so, you know, if you don't want to be a dev, there are roles in security that don't require you to code. 
Um, and I think that's just like a conversation that you have like during the interview process or with the hiring manager, like what are the responsibilities of this job role and how much like coding will it involve? And I've definitely done that. Like I've asked before because I didn't want my job to be a hundred percent dev work and I didn't want it to be like a hundred percent pen testing. I wanted it to be in the middle and I have found that. So yay, go me. Um, but I think just like, you know, celebrate having that those wins. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, but like having that conversation, I think is it's a, it's a legitimate conversation to have, you know, if it's not something that you don't want to do, you shouldn't take the job for that's going to require you to do it. Yeah. Uh, on the other end of that, like, I know that I, I definitely wanted like, I think like a good balance between the like development and coding because I definitely still wanted to have like a developer experience. And I feel like the core conversation I've had with both like uh, the team at Two Sigma I like interviewed with initially and also just like speaking to other people is I think I think it's very important to kind of like discuss that expectation ahead of time of like how much like dev work are you going to do versus like how much security work, uh, especially if you're looking at like security engineering roles. But if you're looking at like roles that don't necessarily like include a ton of like dev work, like I guess like as a part of like the like expectation, then there are definitely like a ton of like analyst kind of roles or like other just like security roles that like don't necessarily like require coding and instead of like the software engineering skills rather than like an expectation or just like definitely just like the more you have it's just like a benefit and you can just kind of like use it and develop it like kind of like at your own pace. There's another question in the chat. What would be a portfolio of security stuff? I have been told hack the box and try hack me scores. Is that right? If you're trying to build a portfolio, you can put out there for, for hiring people. Yeah, for sure. So for portfolio security stuff there, there's definitely like a ton of things ranging from just kind of like general experience and kind of like skill sets to tangible kind of deliverables. So I know I mentioned before certificates and that's like one thing. Uh, the other thing is like if you participate in CTFs or these kind of like security challenges, that's definitely something to include on there too. I feel like you don't necessarily need to be like a top scorer in it. Like just so much as like saying like, oh, I feel like, I feel like just communicating that you like do that and have enjoyed that is already like one step in the right direction. Um, especially, uh, especially like in the realm of like kind of like dev work intersecting the security, if you want to talk about that, um, this also goes back to just like either working on like contributing to existing, uh, projects that intersect with the security area or just doing personal things. I feel like you don't even need to make like something like incredibly like novel, like invent this like new cryptographic algorithm. I feel like just expressing like, oh yeah, I have this like GitHub repo where like, I just implemented a ton of like cool cryptographical things and like integrated it in this like random like thing I was interested in. I feel like that like is very much an extension of like the like developer portfolio where as long as you're just kind of like working on that skill set and showing that like you're actively working on it, I think that's like a way to build it up. Great. I think we're winding down on time. So um, folks can get you on Twitter or will you be around in the, in the Diana initiative in the Hobbin platform to take questions one-on-one? -on -one? You got a preference on how people reach out to you? Uh, I think for me, you know, you can definitely connect with me on LinkedIn, message me on Twitter. I will be here on the platform as well for, to answer any other questions that anyone has. Um, yeah. Awesome. I think the same Most would be true for Maddie. Yeah, both of you have really gotten lots of me thinking about lots of ways of how I can help some of the software software folks transfer, transition over. Um, I had talked to the ladies ahead of time and said, look, this is something I'm super passionate about, calling people over to the dark side of security. <laughs> so <laughs> I love to see this talk here on, on today. Hope you all had a great time. Just a reminder that um, the closing keynote is going to be starting on the stage, I think on the main stage in just a little bit. So really, um, speaker feedback form is in the chat. I've put up the links to both their positions and to the resources for the slides. So I know that um, they're hoping to hear for, from both of you. Okay, thank you ladies so much.
Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest.